Yeah. Um, and if you were to tell me that that Occam's, that you know vacancy would back up a little bit in every asset class, I'd sort of shrug my shoulders and say, "What's about time?" Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So that you know that doesn't that doesn't worry me in the nor in the in the ordinary course. I mean, the big the biggest decision you have to make from a real estate perspective is will people in the future want to engage physically with other people? My view is yes. So thanks for joining us on the podcast. The first question, just to get right into it, you know, you you speak with a lot of the largest organizations in in Canada around the around the world. What are you seeing right now? What's the view look like from from thirty thousand feet up? Um, you know, I, I think the point we find ourselves in today is we're we are post peak panic. Peak panic was probably two weeks ago, um, and we're now in the phase where uh, which will be. Uh, we'll see a lot of finger pointing and credit taking, depending who you are. Um, the, you know, hopefully we're in a phase where um, our governments are working together to sort of think about how to reopen the economy and to do it in, in a relatively uh, fast and as safe a, a process as can be. Uh, and I'm expecting over the next, you know, week or two weeks uh, that we'll start to see ideas and plans being surfaced. Um, and uh, we'll also probably see some uh, some mild surge, but I think Canada has been, with the degree of the lockdown, I think highly successful in flattening the curve and uh, uh, reducing both the number of cases and the number of deaths. So the strategies work. So now we have to sort of figure out what's next, um, and 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 that's the phase that we're quickly moving to. Okay. Uh and I, I'd like to circle back on, uh, you know, discussing what the government's doing and, you know, how you see the economy opening after this. But first, just to dive into uh, what you're seeing on the financing side, um, you know, how has the lending environment changed and what are, what are you seeing from the lenders? So I think uh, with every crisis, um, the lending environment always goes through the same phases. Uh, it starts with uh, a reduction in liquidity as as lenders hold liquidity primarily for their best customers and for issues that they may or may not have yeah. and you know so we're you see uh, spreads gap out uh, you know and some underwriting terms gap gap out um, and you also see uh, most lenders uh, develop a a uh, uh, two lists uh, who's been naughty and who's been nice and <laughs> You know, it's not a good time to be on the naughty list. Right. Can you talk about, so you deal with some of the largest pension funds, um, you know, in Canada, but in the world. What what are they doing? You know, what what struggles do they have to deal with right now and, you know, in the, in the next couple of years? And uh, as a second question there, is there, are we going to see any sort of rebalancing of portfolios now that equities are down? Are people going to try and move weight away from real estate? So, um, you know, quite quite separate issues. I think as to what large institutional investors are doing today, most uh, are focusing on how do they properly mark to market the value of their assets. Um, Q1 appraisals are, are going to come out from all the appraisers with a, um, a big non-reliance provision on them. And so it puts a, a higher onus on both management and the boards of large institutional investors to say, you know, are there any changes we think we should be thinking about? Um, and that's a process that is under active discussion as we speak. Um, as to rebalancing, um, you know, stock markets are off a relatively modest, say, 20 percent from their peak today. So, you know, I'm not sure that that there will be a significant rebalancing uh, from the denominator impact. Uh, I think what will be Perhaps more interesting issue as we go down the road, uh, I think most institutional class real estate uh, and best in class real estate will weather the storm pretty well. And it it will, I think, uh, register globally with institutional and the ultra high net worth investors that actually real, real estate was a pretty good 
uh, shelter in a storm. And, um, and it'll really come to uh, separate the type of real estate, the type of structure that the real estate's held in, who's the manager, what's the strategy, because when it gets tough, it's the operators um, with a great strategy that will be uh, outperform the others. So um, look, look to, um, you know, look to stratification amongst asset classes, amongst ownership types and amongst uh, operators. Okay. Um, and sorry, John, John, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Stratification on, on different ownership so, types and, and I operators? Think, I think you find that certain asset classes, um, uh, you know, are much more resilient than others. Um, and, and then as well, um, so right off the bat, obviously there's some concern with retail. I mean, obviously, um, you know, big office industrial to perform very well, multi res is held in very well. So we'll see. Um, so, so that's, that's over here, um, with regards to how it's held, um, you know, diversified portfolios will by definition tend to always outperform those that are, uh, single sector. Um, and, and so, you know, how it's held, whether it's a REIT or a form or a pool and the balance that that'll become important. And as always, um, the operator, the manager, the GP, whatever the construct is, makes a difference. So those with the right management intensity, focus, leadership, experience, and skills will tend to outperform the other. And so that, that's the stratification. This is no time uh to to uh, be an amateur hour this is this is a time where you'd want your capital with people that have been through cycles before been through difficult times before understand how to own operate preserve and make assets resilient and uh so it's a it's a big part of our strategy uh and you know we're going to come through this fine i mean we'll have some bumps and bruises like you know like whatever but uh i think that that people will look to um to great platforms with even more value after COVID is sort of behind us than before. So yeah. John, you, yeah. you talked briefly about um, just obviously having experience going through these ups and downs. How does this compare to some of the previous um, like financial events that we've had, such as you know the the recession as well as even SARS stuff like that? Um, you know, every crisis is different. And they only share one common trait, which is they all end. Um, <laughs> but if, if you go back and look at uh, the real estate depression, if you will, of the early 90s, you know, basically um, the rest of the world continued and everybody in the real estate business, almost everybody, we didn't. I was with Oxford at the time, but almost everybody else did CCAA and the businesses were very structurally uh, reformed. If you look at 07, 08, um, it really was a light touch, hmm. but uh, it was so unsettling because, you know, there was a point where everybody thought, I don't even know if the economic system uh, will continue. This is a health crisis, and it's very odd because we're all working at home and you're using Zoom and can't see our families unless you're the prime minister, stuff like that. So it is, <laughs> it's a very odd, you know, set of facts. However... It is a health issue and the health issue will be solved. Right. And, you know, regrettably, there'll be some people that get sick and, and quite regrettably, there'll be some people that die. So, you know, those are obviously horrible events, but um, there's no structural impairment in the economy um, and there, there's life on the other side. Now, you know, uh, life on the other side will be different. You know, there's going to be obviously uh, a bunch of debt and a mess. But I look at it this way. It's if you think of yourself in an enormous rainstorm and all of a sudden you find that your basement is flooding badly. So the first thing you do is all hands on deck, deal with the crisis. The basement's flooding, stop the flooding. Then the flooding stops. And the next step tends to be finger pointing. Who left the door open for the basement? Who broke the pipe? Who whatever? Whatever. Then you get to the job of cleaning up the basement and then as you do that, you find out the insurance company is only going to pay for half. So you're out of pocket and uh, and there's some damage. and You had to take your savings or whatever the story is to fix your basement. 
But of course, while you're doing that, you put in a new rug and you get a flat screen on the way through. So net net at the end, you know, life continues and you still use the basement. So at the moment, we're right at the end of the water coming in the basement. And we're about to hear um, your spouse accuse you of leaving the door open. So, you know, um, and, you know we, possibly from you on LinkedIn. And, and we can, you know, we can see, well, I'm, I'm in an apartment, so there's no flood here. Um, but, you know, we we're, we're already seeing, obviously, in the U.S. headlines about, you know, it's China's fault or it's the Democrats fault or it's Fauci's fault or I don't know, somebody's fault um, and, and Trump's fault. Uh, so, you know, we're going to go through that process, but um, we will rebuild at the end. We, we will clean up the mess. Um, the epicenter of pain is small business and it is and it's small business where to have a business, they have to operate out of their premises and they can't. And so they're they're both unable and many unwilling to uh, to pay the rent obligations. Um, and and it, it is we need a fix for this. And the fix for this is not interest free loans because they've got enough debt. You know, the fix for small business has to involve uh, a grant program, which which will end up being sloppy because it is. But we need to get those small businesses up and going. Many are run by families or, or new Canadians or, you know, other very productive parts of our economy. And we've got to make we got to make space and availability for them to get up and get on with it. Right. And and what would that what would that look like? Sort of, you know, serb but for small businesses, you know, kind yeah. of just uh, yeah. direct to well, bank account. I mean, they have started a small business program and, and you know, you, you can get a loan. Right. Um, and and uh, it's interest free for a period of time. And then 25 percent is forgiven if you're in still operation. I mean, if it was me, you know, I'd probably have, you know, I and I'd have to there's smarter people than me to figure this out. But I'd have more of it forgivable if, if you hit certain employment benchmarks those kinds right. of things. and right. uh, so uh if you know a the business survives so it's it's a real business which that loan uh, program uh, applies um but b if if you were able to show a staffing level that was at or close to what you were before covid so you know you hired people back and so on and so forth that you know i'd make more of it forgivable is is there any is there any risk about giving out all this money to you know, people who are laid off and, you know, the businesses, is there any risk that, uh, you know, it's tough to open the economy after that or that um, actually in the long term, you know, we're going to have this massive tax burden? Is that, should that be a concern or solve the, well, solve the problem right now? It's for sure a concern. I mean, you know, nationally, we're going to, our debt's going to go from, uh, was 500 billion, it's going to 600 billion. With this, it'll go to, I don't know, 800 or 900 billion. And, <laughs> You know, for those that were, uh, you know, in a position of leadership or taxpayers in the early 90s, um, you know, you'll remember all the challenges of taking a budget that with a budget deficit that was out of control and getting it tamed and then having 10 years of surpluses. Um, regrettably, you know, three, four years ago, we gave up on the discipline of having surpluses and we built all of these. We built more and more programs and. It was more, well, we can have a deficit of this and that and this and that. Well, and now, of course, we're putting on the super deficit. If we had stayed disciplined for the last four years, then we actually would have had room for everything we need today, which, of course, is what fiscal policy should be. Right. That when, when things are good, you, you pay your debt down. When things are bad, you take your debt up. Um, and, uh, you know, we've you know, we, it got, we, we got easy, we got lazy and, you know, we said, well, maybe a $10 billion deficit is okay. Well, maybe a 20 is okay or a 30 and, you know, whatever. And then of course you have a crisis. So at the end of the day, um, you know, we're going to have bills to pay. Um, and it's really not my generation that's going to have to deal with that. Um, and it's your generation, which um, and, you know, and maybe people will think a little bit more carefully about once we get stabilized again, maybe, maybe, maybe running our country on a balanced basis, or maybe even, God forbid, paying the debt down a little bit is not a bad idea in case there's another crisis. Most families um, try to spend less than they earn, uh, so they have some money for a rainy day, uh, and uh, the government should do the same. Right. 
is there anything, um, you know, just, it sounds like with all that being said, we are going to move right past this, right? Do you picture it as a bump or is there, or is there anything that really keeps you up at night with respect to this, uh, this climate that we're in right now? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's easy in, uh, what I'll call the peak crisis phase, um, peak panic. It's easy to, that, that space is given to all sorts of apocalyptic voices. Um, you know, people <laughs> are working in office again, the, you know, democracy's over, there'll be guns on the street, what, what, whatever the story is. Um, it's actually would not be my view. Um, you know, King sets open for business, we're transacting, um, you know, people are talking, talking to each other all the time, like, you know, stuff's happening. We're responding to RFPs on office space, we're putting out mortgage, mortgage money and so on and so forth. Mm. When, when this is back, back to normal, um, normal will take some time. So when the economy opens up, it'll be gradual and people will, um, you know, sort of move back into a more normal phase. But at the end of the day, most of us don't want to spend our working day in the same room that we spend our evenings. <laughs> so um, right. you know, most of us want to engage with friends and family and go out to entertainment and like all the social things before. And for for sure, my, my whole working career has been based on having coffee and lunches with people. Uh, and right. at the moment, I'm stuck on FaceTime. So, um, uh, you know, <laughs> I think we will go back to uh, a normal. There will be some adjustments. Um, it'll be interesting to see the impact on office space, for example. Uh, people are saying, well, will more people work at home? Uh, maybe. Will, will work remotely be more accepted? Yes. Will that allow a parent to stay home with a child or someone to stay at home because they've got the fridge repairman coming? You know, those kind of things and 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 uh, connect to their office remotely for sure. Uh, will it cause uh, space planners to rethink uh, the densification trend? Because there's been such a movement to get from 200 feet a person to 175 to 150 to and now we're seeing requests for 100 you know, square feet per person and, and as low as 75 in some circumstances. Is that going to back up as people say, you know what, I don't really want to sit 18 yeah, inches right. away from a coworker, um, right. and and I don't want to have to have headphones on. I want to have like a little bit more, you know, space. So <clears throat> there'll be a bunch of those trends all, all sort of come through. I mean, for Toronto specifically, the vacancy in every asset class was unsustainably low going into this crisis. Yeah. Um, and if you were to tell me that that I can, that, you know, vacancy would back up a little bit in every asset class, I'd sort of shrug my shoulders and say, what's about time? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So that, you know, that doesn't that doesn't worry me in the, nor in the in the ordinary course. I mean, the big the biggest decision you have to make from a real estate perspective is will people in the future want to engage physically with other people? My view is yes. Um, yeah that, you know, we'll want to go to a restaurant, we'll want to go to a, you know, that, that, that a bar or a club, or we'll want to go to a hockey game or, you know, whatever. My view is we go back to that. So, right. you know, life kind of goes on. Um, the, there'll be big disruption in global supply chains, particularly for um, mission critical uh, things. I mean, it, it, you know, no one could have imagined that even the US wouldn't be part of our supply chain. And right. So they can't yeah. because they've said, well, you know, we're, we're invoking whatever act he invoked. So, <clears throat> you know, we're going to have to make uh, critical equipment in Canada, store it in Canada, um, which means we're going to have to pay more for it. Um, it's going to occupy more industrial space and manufacturing space and industrial land and so on. Um, and instead of paying, you know, two dollars for that mass that's coming from 3M in Minnesota, we'll, we'll have to pay three dollars for the same mask coming from you know cornwall or mississauga but life will go on and um and i think you know where drugs come from you know respirators and you know it's going to be quite a quite a program so this is so industrial could in fact grow uh to be in higher demand because of this renationalization of uh canadian services and manufacturing and that's, well, that's I think there'll be, there'll be demand on industrial, but there's also going to be demand on office. I mean, just just think on a global basis. 
if you were if you were a global citizen floating around in the etho somewhere and saying like you know and I'm a tech guy, right? yeah. Um, where would I want to work? Great question. Right? I mean, mm. I just think you know Canada presents such a compelling uh, option to uh, a global citizen, and that's why you're going to continue to see uh, the tech. I think continue to drive employment in MTV, Montreal, <coughs> Vancouver. John, do you think uh, do you think co-working is going to have kind of this resurgence? Uh, you know, this is going to result as a catalyst. Uh, we see in down economies, co-working seems to do quite well. Um, do you think this is going to result in some growth? I think in a down economy, co-working is just like hotels. Okay, because it's the it's the first it's the first expense you can cut, and and I think co-working is going to go through a very tough uh, short period of time because. You know, co-working in Toronto, uh, at least half of it is large institutional customers, right? Um, but many of them, uh, you know, Fortune 500, right? Many of them will be saying, you know, that's maybe that lease comes up in 30 days. Uh, maybe we can inboard those people, have them work at home or whatever. But let's let's get that overhead off the agenda. For the for the small startup or individual that's been working at home, they may say, you know what, versus spending two grand a month in rent or 20 grand a month in rent, whatever it is, maybe we just continue to work at home. Right. Um, so I, I, you know, I can tell you from owning the Royal York Hotel that there's a bit of a demand um, decline. And uh, <laughs> no uh, kidding. You know, <laughs> if 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 that was the only thing we did, it would be what they call a unfortunate event. But um, I think travel will come back, you know, relatively quickly. It'll take some time. I would tell you, I think it will come back slower than I would have thought two weeks ago. And I reserve the right to be smart, smarter two weeks from now. But, you know, travel will resume. But I, I think co-working, co-working is going to go through an adjustment. Now, Toronto doesn't have that much co-working space. And so I actually don't think there'll be much of an issue here. Um, New York will be different. I mean, New York has got so much co-working space that I think that that'll create some real headwinds for the New York office market. That's interesting. So, John, just circling back to retail for a moment, what do you think that the long-term implications of this will be on sort of re certain types of retail? Like, obviously, restaurants will come back. People still want to go out. People still want to eat. But sort of those more consumer goods, the stuff that can be more readily bought online through e-commerce, do you think that will be transformed? Or what are your other thoughts? You know, I, I think um, it is the area that's, the most difficult to, um, you know, predict um, for two reasons. You know, retail is the real embodiment of social behavior, and secondly, predictions are about the future. So, um, but but given that, I think that that we'll just see a continuation of the trend we have been seeing, which is is retail and retailers that can offer their customer uh, three things: connectivity, community, and experience. If you can offer those three things, you've got a viable business proposition, whether you're a mall, a street, uh, you know, a street or an individual tenant is just accelerating that trend. Mm -hmm. I think <clears throat> that, you know, open format retail uh, that relies on essentials, groceries, drug and so on. Those people would be OK. I'm not so sure about the other guys. And then, of course, the challenge will be what if the grocery store wants to move? Tricky. Um, in enclosed, you know, I, we we probably have more enclosed malls than we need. Um, and then you'll say, well, you know, to 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 be competitive, you've got to be ever better. So if you're not number one or two in your market, um, probably more in Toronto. I mean, if you're not top six or seven in Toronto, whatever, <clears throat> you know, it's going to be a more challenging environment. Um, and I think you'll see lots of adaptive reuse. Uh, I think you'll see. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's a creative and fluid market. There'll be people saying we need to put more experience into a into a mall. So it's versus seven shoe, shoe stores. Maybe there's five shoe stores, a climbing wall and a gym. Um, you know, maybe we replace uh, the food court or maybe the food court smaller. But we all of a sudden have, you know, a bunch of uh, uh, tabled restaurants. I, I, I mean, lots of people will address lots of different ideas. 
Um, one of the challenges we have here is we hear so much from the U.S. And of course, the U.S. situation is much tougher for a number of reasons. One is there's 50 percent more retail per capita than there is here. Um, and so, you know, whatever right sizing is going to be required, you know, they're 20 yards in the end zone. Right. Um, and in our urban geography <laughs> and definition of our urban uh, geography is different. So, um, you know, if someone says retail, like retail is not dead. Um, it's just evolving. It's been evolving. It's going to continue to evolve. Right. Uh, okay, John, we've talked about retail now. We've talked about industrial and office. Um, you know, a couple months ago, you guys made a bid with along with Starlight to acquire Northview. Um, what are your thoughts on multifamily? I saw, what was it, on Mar- March 23rd, uh, Northview's go to shop marketing period had, had, had finished. Um, how are you feeling about that deal? How are you feeling about multifamily in general? Well, of course, I can't talk about Northview <laughs> okay. in the public domain. And, you know, um, a lawyer somewhere would come out and kill me. But yeah. I think uh, as you look across the waterfront um, amongst all the multifamily platforms in Canada, um, you'll see that largely rent collections were more or less in line with previous months. Um, and, you know, the conclusion that I would offer is that People that can use the real estate they were contracted for pay rent. Businesses that can operate pay rent. But businesses that can access the real estate they contracted for and therefore can't operate, like a donut store or a jewelry store or whatever, they're the ones that struggle. Um, you know, multifamilies, you know, going to go through some increased vacancy, you know, because uh, whenever you lay off a million people, um, people will double up students have gone home you know there's there's uh, kids go back to the parents basement all that stuff goes on right but in time all or most of those people will be hired back and no one wants to live in the parents basement in the first place so you know that that you know like it'll be fine great okay well uh being on the multifamily team here at colliers i appreciate that <laughs> um uh, Sean, so I actually, John, I wanted to do a, like a rapid fire questions because I want to be conscious of your time here. But uh, first, Sean, did you have any any questions for John? Uh, yeah, actually, I did have one question, John, for you. Um, as far as some of the prop tech companies out there when it comes to being an intermediary between, um, you know, buyers and sellers, where do you, th- and, you know, a lot of times with technology sort of stating that it'll solve a problem, but not really and maybe creating another one um where what, what are your thoughts on some of those prop tech valuations and and, and and what are you looking at well you know if if you go back a long time say 45 days um you know 60 days everybody was talking prop tech and esg over the last 30 days they're the only two world words nobody has spoken um and it's because everybody is dealing with uh you know in the present and is focused on the water going in the basement, not on changing the lamps upstairs. So um, I think once we're through this, um, you know, obviously there will be a heightened focus. There, there'll be all sorts of different opportunities for prop tech. Um, bio, you know, biosecurity and bioresilience um, will be a really interesting topic generally um, and a point of great interest to many people. Um, and I think that that um, obviously improving communications, being making Microsoft Teams or Zoom or whatever whatever your uh, protocol of choice is even better and more uh, ubiquitous will be uh, uh, you know will be important. Um, and I think prop tech will have to you know hide in the basement or hide in the closet for four months before we can talk to anybody again. And because. Well, <laughs> Once we're opened up again, then then, then this, the discussion will ensue. But it'll be a very difficult time for the moment. Because it just does, doesn't meet anybody's like top five list today. All right. Uh, okay, John, I've got, a, I've got a few rapid fire questions for you here. Um, so you don't have to give huge answers to these, but it, but very interested in your thoughts. See, uh, <laughs> you see that, that, that joke that, no, anyway, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, where will Kingset be in 50 years? In 50 years? 50. years. What do you say? Five zero. Well, five zero. Well, um, I would say, 
you know, it'll be a dominant global alternative asset manager. Um, you know, we've kind of gone through all of the asset classes and you've mentioned a diversified portfolio and asset managers are going to be the ones to do the best. But if you have one asset, one location to put to put your money to work, what, what would you put that in? Uh, I'd be GTA mixed use. Got it. Um, worst deal uh, you've ever done or a deal that you regret doing? <laughs> Sorry, it's a tough question. It's a tough question. <laughs> 1982, lease negotiation with a law firm for three floors in a national bank building. I held firm on some lease terms there that were irrelevant and they ripped up the LOI. Oh, <laughs> God. Uh, that was bad. Was it, were you at Oxford at that time? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, best deal. Deal, your, your, your favorite deal, most memorable. I think, um, you know, you, you tend to remember the, the largest individual transactions because they were the most, tend to be the most intense. Um, I mean, I, I've had the great opportunity to participate in about a dozen billion dollar transactions and, you know, large complicated transactions are always very high energy because of the complexity, the number of stakeholders and everything. Um, to pick which one would be my favorite is sort of like asking which of your children you like the best, which is- That was the uh, next question. Bad set of facts. <laughs> uh, okay, you're, you're very vocal about your thoughts on government. Uh, when are you going to run for prime minister? Well, I would, I, you know, uh, I don't have the skills um, to do what it would take to be uh, in politics. I've got great respect for those that, that do choose a political life. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough job, takes a lot of skills. That wouldn't be me. Okay. Um, and uh, last question, you're, you're a member of the Business Council of Canada, 150 of the top CEOs that, uh, you know, kind of lead uh, the business uh, businesses of, uh, of Canada. Um, what advice do they have and, and what advice do you have for, for businesses trying to get through this? Well, I think, I think the, you know, I'd offer a couple of things. Number one is, is you have to sort of stay calm and carry on. Um, and you know, you have to have a, uh, make sure you look at your business and your people and your liquidity and so on, decide, you know, how you can, uh, operate or reopen or whatever that story is in a month or three months, you know, whenever that happens. And the challenge for most businesses, most smaller businesses will be to make sure that they've got a keen focus on keeping their teams together, keeping people uh, motivated and, and, and on message as we look to the other side. I think it's important for leadership to reach out to um, to your people. I, I mean, I, I send out a blog post every morning to uh, all King Set people. Um, and because, you know, everybody feels this self-isolation, everybody feels isolated. And uh, so I, you know, I, I try to connect with, with everybody through my post, which is my observations of what's going on, both in King Set as well as in the world. And I encourage uh, everyone to, to, to talk to people when I, and, and preferably not on the phone. Um, talk to people through Zoom or, uh, you know, FaceTime or other things, because people need to see other, other people way more today than they would in a normal world. Okay. Okay. Well, um, John, I think that was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, we really appreciate your insights. Good luck out there. Stay safe. Okay. Take care. Thanks, John. John. Yeah. Thanks. thanks.